So if I were to drop the name Christian Horner on you, how would you all react? Nope. Yeah, thought so. Not the most popular kid in the playground, no doubt. But one can't deny the success that he's had in Formula 1 as a team principal. This guy does know how to lead a team, and we all have to commend him for what he's done in the sport, even if done through gritted teeth whilst giving you the sensation of eating rat poison. But while his success has certainly been present on the managerial side of motor racing, it wasn't quite as successful on the other side of the pit wall. Yes, Christian Horner used to be a racing driver. So how did it all go wrong? And how did it ultimately lead to him being so successful? Back in the early 1990s, little Christian Horner liked racing cars, and he figured that he'd like to race the racing cars too. He begged and pleaded with his parents to buy him a go-kart, which eventually they did. It was initially intended for them to use on the fields of their home, but when British Rain intervened and turned the fields into a wear, he was taken to a local go-kart track which was based on an airfield, and thus began the journey for Christian Horner's racing career. He kept on racing carts for a while, although what exactly he achieved in the motorized tin trays, I'm not so certain. What is certain, however, was what happened in 1991. Back in those days, Renault were dishing out scholarships to promising young drivers who were looking to break through the ranks and into the motor racing scene. Horner tried out, won the scholarship, and was rewarded with a free engine. Not a fully paid season in racing, just an engine. Well, every little helps. It was an engine that he would use to race in the British Formula Renault series. Driving with mana, he was teammates with Harry Nuttall. Shut up. By the end of the championship, Horner had finished fourth in the standings, behind his teammate and a long way away from eventual championship winner and future F1 driver, Pedro de la Rosa. The high points? Well, Horner did win his first round at Pembury, a place where Horner seemed to function properly whenever behind the wheel. So for a first year in motor racing, you gotta give him his credit. For 1993, Horner made the step up into British Formula 3, but he wouldn't be concerning himself with the top level talent that lay there. Instead, Horner would race in the Class B category. Competition isn't as fierce, but it did allow for an easier entry into the category. I think. In the second round, he took the Class B win and was leading the championship. He celebrated this momentous start in the next round by spinning off into the sandbox on the formation lap. He'd fire back through for a win in the next round at Donington and would win in the last three rounds that he did compete that year. So you'd imagine then that I'm about to say that this was a good year for him. Well, <laughs> pump the brakes there, sunshine. While it certainly wasn't bad, he was thoroughly outperformed by Jamie Spence, who won the Class B championship quite convincingly. Warner finished second, but hey, all a learning experience. In 1994, he would make his return to the British Formula 3 series, but this time in the main game. Driving with Fortec Motorsports, he wasn't going to be in the best of the best in terms of machinery. Not that it really mattered, given Jan Magnussen paddled everyone that year, but at least he could be assured that his car wouldn't blow up on him every time he looked at the brake pedal. As is always the case, the best way to truly measure a driver's performance is to see how they did against their teammates. In this case, Horner's teammate was Frenchman Jeremy Dufour. Don't worry, I've never heard of him either. But rest assured, this dude could drive. He got the most fastest laps of any driver that year, acquired a handful of podiums, and finished seventh in the driver's standings. Right, 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 I hear you say, but how did our boy do that year? Well, he didn't do quite as well. Dufour got onto the podium four times. Horner didn't even manage to get into the points that many times. Not quite sure why the deficit was so big, though. Maybe he needed to change his f***ing car. But hey, fun fact about that season, someone else who was racing on that grid? Zach Brown. It appears that to seek the next influential F1 team principal, have a look into the deep mid of the British F3 Championship. 1995, he remained in British F3. Not totally uncommon back in those days, but generally about this time, you would expect to be winning some races, or at least get onto the podium, or at least get a sniff of it. But alas, the only time this year that Horner saw the podium was when he passed one on the way to the Portaloo. His game of jumping from team to team hit its stride this year, completing the first half of the season with Alan Docking Race before switching to Tom's in the second half. This is all part of the problem of a notable absence of money. And the thing is, his results did improve. Sort of. His qualifying was awful. Awful, awful, awful! To a point where, even on some of the widest shots of coverage, you couldn't see his car. Nonetheless, there was a faint sliver of hope that he was just beginning to turn the tide. That's not to say that he was all of a sudden a born against Senna, but at least he was finishing in the points some of the time, rather than none of the time. And reasonably, he thought, this would carry him in good stead heading into 1996, where, despite having now languished in that championship for a fourth year, good results would give him more exposure, more trophies and therefore more Yes. Unfortunately for him, this grand master plan didn't work because after six rounds he scored 
nothing, which is an unhelpful amount in an attempt to win the championship. His only real highlight of the year being part of the start line accident at Donington. And even then, he was so far back that cameras were barely able to capture his car. And he wasn't even the one rolling, so... Yeah. By this stage, he knew he couldn't remain in Formula 3 for much longer. He had two choices, either admit defeat and go home, or else do what he did and say, ah, screw it, let's go for broke. He made the step up to the British Formula 2 Championship for the second half of the season. The result? Fifth place in the overall championship. And he backed up the result with some podiums. Podiums, he got him! And that would be impressive if you ignore the fact that the British F2 Championship was dying such a slow death that in some rounds that year, there were only five drivers entered. Of course, this was all good prep work for the big series of the time. The one that he was aiming for. Formula 3000, the step below Formula 1. But his particular path was of an unconventional nature. He wasn't gonna tag onto a team, pay his way, and arrive and drive the season, oh no! No, no, he was gonna set up his own team. So he sold everything, got as big of a loan as he could muster from the banks, from his family, from CD loan sharks based in a hull fish and chip shop, whatever he could in order to acquire a chassis, two leased engines, a race engineer, and a Norfolk shed to house his car in. He also bought a trailer from a dude in Austria who himself had a Formula 3000 team. They had no money to spare. So if Horner had a shunt, they didn't have much hope of showing up at the next round with a complete car. As a result, he played it safe, kept to his limits, tried to keep his nose clean. Problem is, this did not really translate to results. In the first round at Silverstone, he was way off the pace compared to, well, anybody. So that wasn't exactly ideal, but straight up not qualifying for the next five rounds wasn't much better either. He only qualified for a further three races that year, including the season finale at Jerez where, surprise surprise, he scored his first ever points in the category and was running some decent pace too. Outside of the cockpit, Horner was learning a great deal about what makes a racing team work, learning the fundamentals of race team management, and at the same time was helping build the team that he co-founded with his father, Arden International. And for 1998, he would bring in another driver in Kurt Mollikins. As it would turn out, Mollikins was a street ahead of Horner on pure pace. While Mollikins at one point was fighting for the lead of the championship, Horner wasn't doing that. And then there was what happened in preseason testing. Whilst Horner was exiting the pits at Estoril, he saw one Pablo Montoya whiz by and hurl his car into the first corner with such commitment and guile that it made Horner say, I can't do that. Like, I can't do that. He knew he was nothing special, but he realized then and there that he lacked pretty much everything that it took to match the top drivers of the time, and therefore knew that his time as a professional racing driver was over. He made the call to retire at the end of the season, but it wasn't all a complete waste. He saw something in running a racing team, potential to help it blossom into a viable business. <laughs> nah, profit in motor racing? Nah, surely not. Well, heading into 1999, Horner's first year outside of the cockpit, David Richards from ProDrive came knocking and told him that there was a driver looking for a race seat for the season in the form of a Russian billionaire's son. How original. Victor Maslov was the name. Winning was not his game. And part of that deal was selling half of the Arden team to ProDrive. But being the son of the owner of a Russian oil empire and garage space at one of Britain's best engineering firms, Horner just couldn't resist. And really, could you blame him? Horner took the deal, renamed the team to Arden Team Russia, realized pretty soon that it was all horse manure, and decided to take back control of Arden heading into 2000. Maslov was gone after three seasons, having never come close to points in his time there. But for Arden International, strides were being made. They already had the likes of Mark Horsens and Darren Manning driving for them. Both very good, very accomplished. But for 2002, he would hire Thomas Enge and Bjorn Wertheim. And now, Arden was starting to win stuff. They were the team champions that year. And for 2003, they would retain the team championship whilst also winning the driver's championship with Wertheim. Even if he did commit this war crime in Monaco. 2004, third year in a row, Arden were the team champions. Champions, and their driver, Tonio Liuzzi, was the driver champion as well. Actually, funny story about Liuzzi. At that time, he was being backed by Red Bull and being mentored by an Austrian. The same Austrian who sold Horner his old trailer. The trailer used to help build the foundations of his team and become the powerhouse that it did. That Austrian was Dr. Helmut Marco. Having done everything there is to do in Formula 3000, Horner wondered whether he could make that step up to Formula 1 after all. At least on as a team principal, or something at least. Once Horner let slip to Marco that these were his ambitions, he mentioned, huh. 
Funny you say that, because Red Bull kind of wanted something more within the realms of Formula One. They already were sponsoring Sauber, who, funnily enough, were also sponsored at the time by Petronas. Amazing how things change, right? But Red Bull wanted something more. Toward the end of 2004, there were two F1 teams that were being put up for sale. One of them was Jordan, although their only tangible assets included half a million quid's worth of carbon fiber and half a case of Guinness. So this didn't interest them. The other team though? was Jaguar, who the Ford Motor Company totally butchered in the few years that they had. After having bought the team, and with Marco and Matichitz getting migraines from the management that carried over from Jaguar, they drafted in Christian Horner as team principal of Red Bull, starting from the team's first season in 2005. And obviously, like they say, the rest was history. So, what was the point of this video? Well, that Horner's failure as a racing driver was ultimately what led him to be so successful as a team principal in Formula 1. Yes, he drowned horrifically behind the wheel, but it was his experiences in competing against the best, as well as knowing firsthand what drivers will experience, what makes them tick, how best to extract the performance out of them undeniably played a role. Yes, he ain't the most popular kid in the playground, but he doesn't need to be. And really, who cares? He's achieved a hell of a lot as the captain of Red Bull's ship, and it likely wouldn't have happened had he not tried to achieve the exact same thing from the other side of the pit wall.